it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Uh, professor Thomas Legg is an Associate Professor of History at Westchester University, my alma mater for two degrees there. Uh, his research primarily focuses on technology in the U.S. Navy and also the maritime world in the 19th century, the 1800s. Uh, he has presented his research on naval, maritime, uh, civil war, and technology topics throughout his career, and of course will continue with that trend with us tonight. Uh, in just a few moments, Professor Legg will reveal the technological changes and impacts in the maritime world throughout the 1800s, uh, including the transition from iron to, I'm um, sorry, from wood to iron materials as well. I know I am looking forward to this talk. I hope all of you are as well. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Professor Legg. Yeah. I, I appreciate this wonderful audience. This is, this is great. Um, so. As Leanne said, I've been studying the maritime world for a relatively long time. And uh, I'm not going to deal with this in a very technological way. I'm really interested in terms of how technolo technology and we as human beings interact with it. And so I'm really interested in sort of how, how technology is changing, how do we adapt to it, how we don't adapt to it. And today I'm going to focus mostly on the United States Navy in, in the 19th century because it, it sort of provides us a nice um, envelope with which to work. And there'll be a bunch of little case stories. Um, and and so, so that, that's the plan. Uh, I apologize uh, right up front. Uh, this is the USS <coughs> New Ironside. It's built in Philadelphia. It's built with, with iron that was rolled up in Bucks County. So... Um, so, but it, it's one of the vessels that's part of the story. One of the first things I would like to do is talk a little bit about technology. Most of us, when we think about technology, we usually think about physical things. We think of stuff. Okay? And that is certainly one of the components of technology. But as I, as I suggest in this, this little statement, um, that that smartphone is nothing other than a really expensive paperweight, unless you have the software to go along with the hardware, and unless you have the skill to utilize the software that's in the hardware. And so one technology historian, Judith McGaw, has this really sweet, wonderful, short um, definition of technology that I've been using for years, and it's that technology is the tools, skills, and knowledge needed to make and do things. Okay? So I really want you to be thinking about that technology is not just the physical item. It's, it's a bunch of other things. It's, it's how we use it. It's the systems, etc. And I want to illustrate that. So I'm going to be talking about ships. I'm going to be talking about vessels. Um, and I'm going to be talking about this time period from when we shift from sailing vessels that were made out of wood to eventually, at the end of the story, we're going to be talking about steel ships that are driven by uh, steam power. We probably might think that a sailing vessel is not technologically very sophisticated, but they are. Um, most people would have said that a sailing vessel like this one, the USS Constitution, was of its time period probably the most complex piece of machinery that existed on Earth. It may actually still, in some ways, be just as technologically sophisticated. So I just want you to look, for example, at the rigging of this particular vessel. Um, there are, as, as I say here, there's eight miles of line, rope, that's going to be con con called line once it's put on a vessel, that is used for the running rigging, the, the stuff that moves, so that you can move the mast, so you can raise and lower sails. And there's almost seven miles of additional rope that's used for the standing rigging or the stuff that doesn't move, some of the, the stuff that's holding up the mast. That's a lot of rope. That's a lot of line. Okay? Um, they control a lot of sails. On this particular vessel, depending on how you rig the vessel, you can rig it differently for different particular purposes. That vessel carried anywhere from 46 to 48 sails. Okay? And each one of those sails is going to have a number of lines connected to it. Okay? And each one of those sails, in some way, shape, or form, affects every one of the other sails. So if somebody says, well, we have to adjust the sail, 
Just imagine you have 46 sales up and you need to adjust one sale. That means you have to adjust all 45 of the other sales as well. Okay? It's a really complex technology. It's a technology that most people would have learned through working with it. You don't go to school to learn how to sail a vessel like that. Okay? You, a midshipman in the late 18th, early 19th century, a, a junior officer in the US Navy, would have started out as a 12 or 13 year old on one of those ships. And that's where they would have gotten their education. Now, just to show you how complex that is, this is, this is Lieutenant Peter Turner's station bill. He served on the USS Constitution, and he's responsible for running this particular mast on that vessel. So to go back, he's responsible for running that particular mast. And what you see here is you see this is the mast, and these are the various spars on that on that. And each one of those words is the name of one of the men that is serving to work to run the sails just on that particular mast. Okay? Now, the vast majority of those people have no idea how to run this thing. <coughs> that guy, he needs to know how every adjustment to every one of those sails on that mast is going to affect every one of the other sales. Now, he's a junior officer, he's a lieutenant. Senior officers, they're, they're going to not only know how that mass works, they're going to know how all of the other mass work. And you may own a vessel like the Constitution that carries somewhere in the order of 600 to 800 men. You may have three or four people on the vessel who really understand how to actually run the entire vessel as a technology. Okay? So we're talking about an incredibly complex technology. It's a technology that senior officers have spent 20, 30, 40 years learning how to operate. They're masters of their craft. Do you think they want to learn something new? Now, there's another part of that ship's technology that is not quite so apparent from those other pictures. Okay? This is a picture from the U.S. Constitution when it was in dry dock in the 1990s when it was being rebuilt. Okay? And to me, this is just an unbelievable picture as a maritime person. This is a picture, obviously, of a hull, but it's also a picture of the hull from the stern, stern from the back end of the, the boat. Okay? That is an incredibly finely built stern of that particular vessel. The beauty of the USS Constitution, if you know anything about it, is it, it's never going to lose a naval battle because it's never going to fight a naval battle against a ship of its equal. What it's always able to do if it runs into ships that are more powerful than it, it's able to just sail away from it. Okay. <laughs> Um, and that was by design. The United States Navy at this point recognized that they did not have enough ships to compete with the British in, in, in a one-to-one -one level, and so that's part of the design. Okay? So some of the technology is also hidden. You don't, you don't ever, ever see it. And the British actually used to get very mad at the Constitution saying that it was built in an unfair way. Okay? <laughs> All of the point of all of those sails and knowing how to operate them and what's going on below the waterline is because Navy vessels are obviously designed to destroy other Navy vessels. And at this point in time, the way you engage in battle is very, very close quarters. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to maneuver your ship. The vessels have almost all of their ordnance on the sides of the vessels. And what you're trying to do is outmaneuver your opponent so that not that you're side to side, but rather it's called crossing the T. You want to cross in front of them or behind them, and then you fire all of your guns at them from a position where they don't have any guns to fire back. And what makes the Constitution so effective, all of those sails, that incredibly beautiful hull, is that it's also incredibly maneuverable. But somebody has to know how to do all of that. So again, we have this incredibly complex technology. But there's a problem. 
Okay? There's a problem. Technology is changing dramatically in the early 19th century. There's all kinds of new things happening. <coughs> steam engines, for example, have been created. And people <coughs> had this great idea, let's put steam engines on ships. It's not just a simple matter of throwing a steam engine into a wooden ship. It's a little more complex than that. Engines, they shake, they rattle. If you put that in a traditional wooden ship, the ship literally shakes apart. So it's much more complex than that. And, and there's something else going on. It's the psychological. So I have a picture here. This is a picture of a grain ship from the early 20th century. We're still using sailing ships to carry cargo even into the 20th century because they're so cheap to run, okay? Um, and this is a picture of, of a vessel in the South Seas, uh, go, probably going around um, South America, the, the tip of South America, some of the roughest, <coughs> roughest waters in, in the world. Um, and these guys are obviously up in the rigging, having to maneuver sails, etc. Um, being out on the high seas, it's a pretty dangerous world. Um, pictures are two-dimensional. They flatten out things. Those seas are probably on the order of 30 to 40 foot. Okay, So you're talking about 30, 40 foot waves. And those ships are going back and forth. That, you know, that mast is probably moving somewhere. If you're out here, you're moving somewhere in the order of 100, 150 feet on each swing. Okay? Uh, it's, it's a pretty rough, dangerous world. Not surprisingly, if you're out there, you want something that you, A, know, and you want something that works. People who sail on sailing <coughs> ships pretty reluctant to change technologies just for the heck of changing technologies. You know, today I have students, they walk in with $1,000 cell phones. Next week they'll have a $1,200 cell phone. They'll just change them. They have no, no compunction about changing or shifting from one technology to another. Back then you don't, and in the maritime world, you don't want to just change technology for the heck of it. You want something that works. Because if it doesn't work, you die. Okay, so there's this there's this reluctance in the maritime world in general to adopt technology. So I I, I just like my little cartoon that I found. So sort of. <laughs> now the United States Navy in the early 19th century is an incredibly small, weak navy. If you look in the rankings of navies. Uh, around the 1820s and 30s, the United States is on par with the Navy of Egypt. Okay? Uh, we, we're not a world power. That's, that's going to come at the end of this story. Okay? We're, we are a minor power. However, we like to think we play with the big boys. Great Britain is the big boy. Okay? And this is a picture of a British fleet. Uh, the United States Navy at the beginning of the Civil War consists of a total of 42 ships for the entire world. Okay? This is a picture of just one British fleet. Okay? The, the scale is just completely different. And the United States sort of admires and wants to be like Great Britain. But we know we can't build the kind of fleet they have. Their, their, their scale is out of our, our, out of our world at this point in time. Um, great Britain is actually not one of the great innovators of technology. No big military power likes to change technology. If you, for example, change wooden ships into iron ships, if you change sail ships into steam ships, every one of those ships is obsolete. You have to throw them away. You have to replace each and every one of them. So the British, they kind of like things where they are. They're in first place. They like staying in first place. So Britain is usually not the one who is, who is leading the technological world. It's their competitors. And the two competitors that are going to make many of the changes in the 19th century are the United States and the French. But even there, we're still going to see some reluctance. <coughs> um, having said that, I'm still going to use some British pictures just from illustrations. Um, we're now going to start adding steam power into a vessel. 
As I said, it's not such a simple thing of just throwing a engine into a ship. There's all kinds of things you have to do. Not the least of which is you have to figure out how in God's name you convert the energy from an engine that's going up and down to a propeller or something else that's going around and around. Okay? The early way of doing this was building paddle wheels. That's sort of the first way of propelling a steam vessel is with the paddle wheel. And you've seen them in tourist towns, etc. Um, they work. But in a Navy vessel, they're somewhat problematic. They're a really easy target to hit. Okay? And so we, we need something else. Eventually, we're going to come up with this thing called the screw propeller. But the problem is, is, is a lot of these Navy guys, they were really reluctant to use them. This is a new idea, and, and it's hidden. You can't see it. Okay? And so they had to do tests like this. This is, a, this is an image of a test in 1845 in Great Britain, where they take two vessels, basically the same size, same, same displacement, same power of the engine. One is a paddle wheeler, and the other has a screw underneath there, a propeller. And they play tug of war. And in this particular case, the, the Rattler won the tug of war. It literally pulled the other vessel three knots. And that was when Britain says, OK, maybe, maybe this is the way we need to go. Now, this is 1845. Having said that, I want to talk about this guy and this vessel. This is the USS Princeton. It is going to be starting to be built in 1842. Okay. Now, John Erickson's a really interesting guy. You probably have heard him a number of times in connection with the maritime world with the USS Monitor. Okay. He has a really long history. He's a Swede by birth. He's actually working in the English technology Navy field in the 1830s. He is the one who is inventing the screw propeller. The English Navy rejects his ideas and what does he do? He comes to the United States. And the United States are going to embrace his ideas. So it, it sort of illustrates that idea of, of the British are a little reluctant as this big power. Now, this particular vessel, the USS Princeton, contains a bunch of revolutionary ideas. Okay? Um, it has a screw propeller, and this is, this is his artwork for that screw propeller. It's a really cool propeller. We think of a propeller, you usually think of one propeller. There's actually two propellers here. And the first one, this propeller turns this direction. The rear propeller turns the other direction. And the reasoning behind that is, is because the one propeller is putting torque, which is moving your vessel in, another, in a certain way. So the other propeller is counteracting that. It's a really, this is 1842. This is a really sophisticated machine that he's building, OK? Um, he does some other things um, that were completely revolutionary. He puts the engine below the water line. Now, you say, well, of course that makes sense, because then you can't hit it with a projectile. The problem is, is you need an engine that's small enough that you can actually put down below the water line. He actually designs an engine that is going to actually fit below the water line. He's going to do all kinds of other things. Um, if I go back to that previous picture, uh, this is obviously a vessel that has both steam and sail power. The steam is meant to be used as an auxiliary. You use it when you go to battle. You sail through the oceans. You use wind because you're not spending any money. But then when you go to battle, then you can maneuver with your engine, and that's the way you can put yourself into a into an advantageous position. Now, the other thing about him, though, is, is he's thinking about something else. He's also thinking about the way ships fight. <coughs> and he <coughs> recognizes that the United States isn't going to be able to build a lot of these vessels. Okay? And so the way you armed your vessels before, as I showed you before with the USS Ironsides, you have your guns on a gun deck, and you have them on the side, and you have your ships come very, very close. Okay? Um, they often fight within 500 yards of each other. Okay. He designs a gun, along with some English engineers, that is going to be much larger than the guns that were in use, 
and can actually fire a projectile as far as four, six miles. Whereas the guns that were in use at this point in time fire projectiles only about a mile distance. He is going to put those guns, not very many of them, he's going to put them up on the main deck rather than on a lower gun deck. And the idea is, is they will be on what was called a pivot. We might think of it the modern way as on a, in a turret. There's no protection around it. But it's on a pivot so you can swing the gun. And his idea is, is we can do what? We can attack another vessel from five miles, six miles away. We may not have many guns. But their guns, even if they have 20 times as many guns as we have, they're useless against us. And we can use our engine to stay out of their range. And we can literally, through time, defeat the enemy this way. He's trying to revolutionize the whole idea of what a Navy vessel is. Okay. Uh, one of the other things that he does, um, you can't see it here, because there's an engine down here, and there's a funnel for the for the steam, but now since it's being used as a sailing vessel, it's actually a collapsible funnel. It only extends when you are under steam power. So these are these are the ways that Ericsson is thinking. That would have been a typical gun. I, I may be jumping ahead. How was this idea accepted by the Navy? Well, that's what I'm trying to get to. Okay. Okay. <laughs> they, they're accepted by one guy, and we're going to get there. Now, this would have been the typical gun that we would have been using in the 18th and 19th century. It's called a 32-pounder. They call it a 32-pounder because it fires a solid projectile that weighs 32 pounds. Aren't they clever? Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it's about 10 foot long. It weighs, as you can see, about 7,000 pounds. The ball is about 6 and a half inches in diameter. It can fire a projectile about a mile in total distance. So you can't shoot it very far, OK? Ericsson's gun looks sort of like that, except it's not Ericsson's gun, OK? That is the Navy officer who brings John Ericsson to the United States. His name is Robert Stockton. He probably stopped at his rest stop on a New Jersey turnpike at some point, OK? Robert Stockton is a Navy officer, and he is ambitious. He sees Ericsson in England. He says, you're not treating me well. Why don't you come to the United States? And he gets all of Ericsson's ideas built into the USS Princeton, okay? including this idea of these really, really large guns. Now, Robert Stockton is all about himself. So he says, I'm going to build my own gun. And it's going to be just as good as his. And of course, he's good at public relations, so he gives his gun a name. It's called the Peacemaker. Okay. Now, traditionally, guns at this point would have been made out of cast iron. Okay? You will, some of you probably know about cast iron, some of its advantages, some of its disadvantages. And a cannon, its major disadvantage is, is that when it fails, it usually fails catastrophically. It doesn't, it doesn't just slowly fall apart. It just bursts. Okay? Um, and so, so this particular gun, the one, this is, a, this is being modeled after John Erickson's. John Erickson built his out of wrought iron rather than cast iron. And what's most important is this band around here. It's also made out of wrought iron. And the idea is, is that if the barrel itself is in a weakened condition, the band is going to hold the gun together. Okay, that's the logic. Now, John Erickson is an engineer. He knows the way things work. He knows that this band and that barrel, they have to be married together very, very closely. So the way he and the English engineers did it was they heated the band. They made it the same size as the barrel of the gun. And then they heated the band so it expanded. And then they slid it onto the gun when it was red hot, and it shrunk down. And in, in essence, it married the metals together. Well, Robert Stockton doesn't understand metal. He doesn't understand iron. He doesn't understand steel. He doesn't understand how John Erickson's done this. So he says, why don't we just take a band of wrought iron and just wrap it around and weld it on? And that's the way he does it. 
Well, the problem with welding it on is, is there's gaps. And lo and behold, well, guess what? It's not going to work so well. Now, the story is, is, is a little better. Um, Robert Stockton has built a vessel based on all of John Erickson's ideas. Um, when the vessel is ready to leave New York City and go down to Washington, Erickson is planning on going to Washington to get some of the credit for this. Stockton tells him, be at the dock at such and such a time, and, and then we'll leave. Erickson gets there at the appointed time, and Robert Stockton sails by on the USS Princeton and waves and basically <laughs> says, see you later, sucker. Yeah. Takes the vessel down to Washington, D.C., takes the vessel out on a junket. He is going to show this to the politicians because politicians need to pay for this ship, this ship and many like it. And of course, what does everybody want to do? They want to shoot the gun. They don't, they don't care about the engine, they don't care about the screw, all those, it's like having a house, you know, you see all these, these new uh, HDTV shows and, and you have a problem with the house and you're redoing it. People don't want to fix the foundation, right? They don't want to fix the electricity, they don't want to fix the plumbing. They, they want a really nice tile, they want a really nice stone countertop, right? So they build a house and then the house falls down, right? Well, everybody wants to see the gun and Robert Stockton, yep, we'll fire the gun for you. The president, John Tyler, is on the trip, comes up, they fire the gun. There's so many people that eventually John Tyler says, this is, I've seen the gun fire enough, I've had enough. He goes down below decks. And now people who weren't able to get close to the gun before are now able to get there because all the dignitaries have left. Well, not all the dignitaries. They fired the gun. It's only about the sixth time they fired the gun, and the gun burst. Okay? It's a very large gun. It has a 10-inch bore. It weighs about 12 tons. It bursts into numerous parts, sweeps across the deck. And as you can see, it kills six people, including the Secretary of State and the Secretary of the Navy. It's not John Erickson's gun. Okay? John Erickson's gun is happily on the stern of the vessel. Okay? John Erickson's gun is never going to burst. Robert Stockton's gun is the one that burst. The reason why we actually still have a peacemaker is because he made a bunch of them, and they were never going to fire another one afterwards. <laughs> okay. Where is that one? Um, it, it's in some Navy Yard in Washington, called the Washington Navy Yard. Um, Robert Stockton is now going to place, place all the blame, of course, on John Erickson. Okay? Uh, John Erickson's not going to get paid for all of the work that he's done. It's going to make him a very angry, upset man. He says, I will never have anything to do with the United States Navy again as long as I live. He's going to change his mind eventually. Okay? Uh, Robert Stockton, of course, is a good public publicity kind of guy. He demands a court-martial, and they do it, and of course, they find him not guilty. It was a, a problem that could not have been foreseen, et cetera, et cetera. But the Navy is not going to build more USS Princeton's. They're not going to use the screw propeller. They're not going to use these big guns that can fire six miles rather than having to bring your ships up together. Basically, the United States says, we're going to stay exactly where we are. Which, of course, means what? That you're going to still be ranking up there with Egypt as a world power. <laughs> There are other people who are competing with the French, or with the British. And a Frenchman by the name of Henri Poxens, he is coming up with a new idea roughly the same time. He is saying that rather than having a gun that fires a solid shell, what we should do is design guns that sh shoot um, explosive shells. Fill a, a shell with gunpowder, Shoot it just fast enough so that it lodges into the side of a wooden ship, and then it explodes, and you do a heck of a lot more damage. Paxson, a Frenchman, is trying to do what? He's trying to use technology to compete with the much bigger, bigger British Navy. How does technology move? It moves through people. This guy, John Dahlgren, United States Navy officer, 
a United States Navy officer who gets seasick every time he goes out to sea. So he does everything possible to not go out to sea. Okay? And so what he does is he, he volunteers to be involved with ordnance. And he travels to Europe, he runs into, the, uh, into Henri Poxens, and he brings the idea back to the United States. And he is going to argue for 20 years this new gun, and eventually he's going to create this gun called the Dahlgren gun. Okay? It looks like that. It's also known as the soda bottle gun. Based on, you see the shape of it? It's, it's very, 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 very thick at the breech, and, and very, very small at the end of the muzzle. The idea is, when you fire a projectile, most of the, pro most of the pressure, the highest pressure is, is when the projectile is here and the powder's there. Obviously, when the powder converts from a solid to a gas, that's where the highest pressure is. But as the projectile moves down the barrel, the pressure's going to lessen. And so he figured out the idea, he didn't actually figure it out, there were actually people who were actually drilling holes in cannon all along the barrel and putting pressure gauges in. He's just duplicating their work. He says, if I build a gun with all of the metal back there, that will solve this problem of guns exploding. Well, there's other things that are connected with this. Um, he found through his test that if you fired the projectile much more slowly, it tended to be more accurate. What he was coming to grips with, he didn't realize it. Have, have any of you seen the movie, The Right Stuff? The one with Tom Wolfe, with, with the, uh, what's his name, uh, Chuck Yeager, the pilot. When he's trying to get to the sound barrier, the plane starts shaking. As you approach the speed of sound, you are hitting literally a wall and everything is moving. Once you get through the speed of sound, all that disappears. They were firing guns roughly at the speed of sound. And what that meant was they were not as accurate. And so he designed his gun to fire the projectile much more slowly. Now the beauty, the advantage of that, he's also creating a weapon that is going to lodge in the side of the ship and explode. That's the whole premise of it. Okay. Now there's, there's going to be one problem with his idea. I suspect you can understand that already. Um, Eventually, by the 1850s, the United States Navy is going to say, OK, we're, we can build new ships. And this is going to be the new line of ships that we're going to build. It's called the Merrimack class. Okay? And you can see we built a bunch of them. Uh, I, I want you to remember this one, the USS Roanoke, because we're going to see it in a few minutes again. Okay? It's a very traditional ship that looks a lot like the Ironsides, with the exception of what? It has a steam engine. In other words, it has its armament in the gun deck just like the iron sights would have had it. In other words, the only thing that's new about this is that it has auxiliary steam power. John Dahlgren is arguing a completely different idea. At the same time that those other vessels are being built, he convinces the Navy to give him one test vessel, and this is the vessel that they build. It's the USS Niagara. See what's missing? There's no gun ports. Instead, he's built these massive guns. This is an 11-inch Dahlgren gun. Okay, uh, Weighs about 16,000 pounds. The shell weighs 136 pounds. Okay? There's, they're on the, on the main deck. And they're all designed to fire. They can move. They can be on pivot. Now, if you look really closely, what's really cool about this picture is, is there's a bunch of things down in the front okay, that are connected to this. So here's how you swab out the gun, et cetera. There's a, a canvas a bucket, et cetera. So those are some of the accoutrements for that particular gun. That's a really massive gun. The Niagara was designed with a dozen of these guns on the main deck. And they all can pivot. And so the idea is, is he's creating a modern weapon, the, a modern warship. The problem is he's building it with a really old kind of cannon. Okay? It's cast iron. It's smooth bore. It's very slow. Okay? It doesn't have a very long range. He does not win the battle. He basically gets rejected. And then this happens. This is the USS Merrimack. 
after the U.S. Merrimack was scuttled in the Norfolk Navy Yard, the, the Confederates raised it and they rebuilt it as the CSS Virginia. When the Virginia was built, suddenly the United States Navy was really interested in technological change. We now need to do something. The United States Navy put out a request. So there's the date, August 7th, 1861. They asked for proposals to build iron armored vessels to compete with the CSS Virginia. They eventually got something like 17 proposals. They ended up building three of them. This is one of them. This is the USS Galena. It's a traditional wooden ship with wrought iron armor, okay? It's, it, it's about two and a half inches of wrought iron on the sides of the vessel. They had about one inch of armor up on top of the vessel, okay? The main idea of this was the armor wasn't supposed to really do the job. It was rather the way that this was shaped. And they were thinking that if you attacked it with a ship that had its guns out of a gun port, What's going to happen, the, gun, the, the projectile is going to come in, it's going to hit, in essence, a glancing blow, and then and ricochet off the ship. Well, they're going to take that vessel up the James River, um, confined area, and the Confederates are going to have guns up on the hillsides, and they're going to be firing down from above, where you only have between one half inch and one inch of armor on the top, and all of the projectiles are going to pierce the vessel, and they're going to say, you know, maybe this isn't a good idea after all. Okay? The second of the vessels was the USS New Ironsides. Okay? As, as I was saying to you before, a uh, massive vessel for the time, over 4,000 tons displacement, um, draws when, it, when it's fully loaded, draws over 22 feet. Um, with all of those sails and its massive engine, top speed, seven knots. Okay? Not a very efficient vessel. And this is, of course, the one that everybody knows. This was the third one. John Erickson had to be convinced. Somebody said, I understand you have a plan. And they convinced him to submit the plan. It's the USS Monitor. Now, does anybody remember the date of the proposal when it was sent out? It was August 7, 1861, okay? The battle between the Monitor and the Merrimack is going to occur on March 8th and 9th of 1862. That vessel will be built between August of 1861 and March of 1862. And not only is it going to be built, it's going to be built in New York, it's going to be launched, it's going to be commissioned, and it is going to be brought down to the Chesapeake Bay all in that time period, okay? Why has it become so important? Because it happens to be available. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk about this particular vessel and, and some other technology stories. Um, it's, it's, it's a really unique vessel. Erickson's playing his unique ideas again. Again, we've got the screw propellers. Um, the, the key here is, of course, is we have our turret. There's our turret. Um, what makes, they, he calls this a floating battery, and the idea, it's, it's, it's he thinks it's impervious because basically there's no target. There's very little vessel that's above the water. Uh, this is going to prove to be a real problem in the long term. Just kind of another quick little technolo technology story. Um, life on these vessels is horrendous. Okay? Most of the vessels below water. You have a black iron uh, deck on the top of this vessel. You're sitting in a nice sunny day. You have a steam engine below the, below the temperatures 150, 160 degrees. Okay. Eventually, what they're going to find is they're going to have to have at least two crews for each one of the vessels, and they're just going to have to rotate them in and out. Okay. And they're going to have to have hotel ships wherever one of these vessels are, so that the men could be taken off of the ships and put on to the hotel ship so they can recuperate. And, and, and you see a really other fun story during this time. Um, the ice trade during the Civil War is going to be absolutely huge. They're going to be harvesting ice up in New England and bringing it down to the south. And, and why is it? So that they can cool these guys off, literally. Okay? That is the Virginia attacking the wooden fleet in Hampton Roads. That is the sinking of the USS Cumberland. 
every wooden ship is now effectively obsolete. The next day, the monitor meets it, they fight to a stalemate. Now, two pictures of, of the monitor post-battle. Um, it's, not, it's not as impervious as many people would have thought. If you look closely here, here are the remnants of a few of the shots from the CSS Virginia. Um, the Virginia came to recognize it had a small target, and it came to recognize um, that it was, it was, you know, those were bouncing off, but clearly they were having, they were having an effect on uh, what they didn't realize when they hit a rivet head on. It popped the rivet on the inside, and that suddenly meant that you had this incredible projectile running around inside of the turret. Now, they didn't, they didn't know that at that point. What they were aiming at was they were trying to hit the gun ports. And it became very obvious that that's what they were trying to do. So what the captain of the monitor did was he, every time they fired the weapons, these weapons take a long time to load and, and fire, uh, approximately inside the turret of one of these vessels, about 10 minutes. So rather than leaving your gun ports to the target, every time they fired, then they would rotate the turret so that the gun ports were facing the opposite direction. Then they would load them. Of course, they're, they're, now they learn to wait until the gun turret turned, and then they turn the gun turret, fire, and turn around. Now, the problem is, is it takes about two minutes to actually rotate the turret 180 degrees. <laughs> So they could literally wait and watch. OK, here it comes again. <laughs> and, and, but that's what they were aiming for. They were aiming for those, those turrets. Um, we obviously recognized it wasn't a very good technology. But the United States Navy said it stopped the Virginia. So we started making USS monitors. There is going to be this monitor fever, as it was called. We're going to make a lot of them. We're going to make a lot of them just like the monitor with a single turret. But if one turret's good, isn't two turrets better? Okay, so we start building two turrets. Now, I, I, I have this picture here on purpose. This is a modified monitor. This is called an ocean-going monitor. Okay, this is the USS Onondaga on, on the right. Um, I don't know what the heck makes that ocean going, but look at the freeboard there. You've got about six inches of freeboard. I've sailed in the ocean. I would not. You could not get me on that vessel, uh, maybe in a lake, a really small lake with no wind. But could you imagine that's called an ocean-going monitor? Well, if one, mo one turret's good, two turrets are better, could anybody suggest what would be even better? Three turrets. <laughs> Three turrets. Okay. Now, anybody see the name of that vessel? That's the Roanoke. What they did was they said, oh, that... Vessel of 1855, that's obsolete. So what they did was they took the top of it off and they now turned it into a three turret monitor. By war's end, there are going to be more than 50 monitors built. Okay? One of the reasons why the United States, the Union, is able to win the war is because they have an industrial capacity that just so far surpasses the South. I'm going to shift gears really quickly here. Um, the monitor obviously serves a purpose, but the Navy recognized that it wasn't a vessel for all things. One of the biggest problems they had during the Civil War was chasing down blockade runners, specialized vessels that could sail very fast in and out of ports, <coughs> carrying really important cargo. So the United States also built ships to deal with that. This is one of those ships. This is the USS Wampanoag. Okay? It was a revolutionary vessel. It's wooden hull, but it's it's an incredibly incredible steam propulsion system. Um, so you can see when it did its sea trials, it ran 633 nautical miles from Barnegat down to Tybee Island in heavy seas, 16.6 knots. Now remember the New Ironsides was seven knots top speed. This is the fastest vessel in the entire world. Okay. It is going to hold the United States Navy speed record for more than two decades at this point. You would think that the United States Navy would like a vessel like this, wouldn't you? It is going to be decommissioned in 1869. 
all that technology that was coming out, it offended a lot of those old Navy officers. Those old Navy officers gained control over the administration of the Navy at the end of the Civil War. The person who became the Secretary of the Navy was this gentleman, David Dixon Porter. He's part of this old guard. He leads the condemnation of the USS Wampanoag. In fact, he goes so far as to pass a regulation as Secretary of the Navy requiring any Navy officer in charge of a vessel who uses steam power must submit a report directly to the Secretary of the Navy explaining and rationalizing and defending his use of steam power rather than sail. Now imagine if you're a Navy officer and you have to write a report explaining why you are using steam power. What is the Secretary of the Navy telling you? Do not use steam power. Okay. Now the British Navy actually took that a step further. They passed a similar regulation. They actually, if you did not get approved for your usage, the captain had to pay for the coal that was used. <laughs> the United States Navy didn't go quite that far. But you can see both navies are, are really struggling with this idea. Eventually, of course, though, we're going to see the Navy finally embrace it. And how are they going to embrace it? Because some junior officers are going to say, we have to create a whole new system. They recognized that Annapolis was actually part of the problem. So what they did was they created a graduate school. It's there. It's at the, at the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. Its first <coughs> commandant is this gentleman, Stephen B. Lu Stephen B. Luce. Stephen B. Luce was a junior officer. He was a young lieutenant during the Civil War. He's about 22 years old. He recognized why technology was important. At the same time that this is happening, we see the first, what are sometimes considered the first modern American Navy vessels, the ABCD ships, okay, the Atlanta, the Boston, the Chicago, and the Dolphin. They're the first steel warships made in the United States Navy, 1883, 1884, 1885. But you see what's interesting about them? They may be steel ships, but what do they still have? Sails. They still have sails. So even though they're starting to move, this is, this is 1883 to 85. It's ultimately one of the other officers working at the Naval War College, this guy, Albert Thayer Mahan, who reaches not only the public, he reaches powerful politicians like Theodore Roosevelt when he writes his book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. The argument is, is that if we want to be a great power, we have to command the seas. You have to get rid of the old guard, and that's exactly what happens. And the aftermath, you end up with what's really considered the first modern war vessel, the USS Maine, which of course is going to have its own history. But what you now have is not only a steel ship, you have a steel ship without sails, and you also have a ship that is fully armored. It is the first American Navy vessel that is a fully armored modern warship. You can see it's embracing some of the very ideas that Ericsson had with turrets, etc. And not long after, you have the Great White Fleet. So we've gone within a century, we've gone from a Navy that is rejecting technology to one that's fully embracing it. Okay. Thank you so much. Any questions? Comments? Yes, sir. What did the first uh, rifle cannon come into play? Um, Really cool, interesting story. Rival cannons are coming in in the 1850s. Okay, um, John Dahlgren, that guy who I showed you before, he he resists using rifled cannons in the United States Navy. Um, the the uh, some of the some American vessels are using them. They're importing them from England. Okay, um, but Dahlgren eventually is going to be forced to build rifled cannon. But of course, he's going to build them out of cast iron, and you can only imagine what's going to happen when you build a rifle cannon. cannon. Um, there was, in one of those slides when I talked about the old guard, uh, I, I don't know if you noticed, I said John Dahlgren now became part of the old guard. Yeah. And John Dahlgren was now used by the old guard. John Dahlgren's Dahlgren guns are actually going to still be on Navy vessels right through the 1880s. Um, and, and 
they're using him now. They had they rejected him in the 1850s, but in the 1860s they used him for their own purposes. And now Dahlgren, defending his own technology, is resisting the use of rifle technology. So, iron plates for the original monitor or for some of the other monitors. Uh, there are different stories that I've heard. Uh, there was a mill between here and Northbrook. Uh, there's some story that plates were made there for the first. Uh, monitor or later monitors, and were any plates made here for I, the monitors? I do not know if, if the USS monitors. I know where the I know where the plates were bent for the for the USS monitor. The monitor was built at the Continental Ironworks, and they were the plates were bent at the Novelty Ironworks, which was adjacent to the. But I don't know where the plate itself had been rolled. Where was that? Brooklyn? Bro that's in Brooklyn, right. And actually, the, it's, it's a, I grew up about five blocks away from where the, the Continental Ironworks existed. So, you know, sometimes I wonder why I ended up doing what I did. <laughs> and, and, and so, but I don't know, I don't know, I just know where the monitor is built and where the plates were bent. I don't know where those plates were actually uh, rolled in the first place. So, um, and, and they built so many monitors, they were getting, they were getting rolled plate from all over. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's some Pennsylvania uh, plate, but I don't know if any from here. So. Yes? Um, you've got turrets. When did they start to put breech loading instead of um, muzzle loading? <laughs> Uh, that's that's going to be in, in some countries in England. They're putting breech loading rifles in by the early 1870s. In the United States, they're not putting them in until the 1890s. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Was there any skepticism by the general public from wood to iron? I mean, did people think it was foolish? It would sink, or what was the, what was the mentality about? Yeah, there there is there is some of that, and you you know you have to prove to people that you can you can do this. Uh, I, I'm not don't know if you're familiar. In the late 19th century, there were actually some concrete ships built, and you know same thing. How can you build a ship out of concrete? Um, uh, so yeah, there there is absolutely skepticism. But I would say by and large, the, the the general public is is pretty pretty accepting of technological change in the middle of the 19th century. There, the country as a whole is is you know, really embracing. It, it's sort of part of, of the American idea. If you go, for example, to the uh, Philadelphia Exposition in 1876, it is just a, a celebration of American technology. And Americans really sort of embrace it. I think it's, it's, actually, it's actually some of the people within the institutions that are really resisting change. Now, they're not resisting it from the perspective that they don't think that you can make an iron chip that's going to float. They, they are resisting it for, for other reasons. Uh, you know, you put an engine on a ship, for example. You've spent 30 years learning how all these sails work, right? And then you put an engine on the ship. You also put what on the ship? You put an engineer. Who's suddenly in charge of the ship? Is it the captain or is it the engineer? Um, and so what you see in the United States Navy, the, 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 what are called line officers, they win a battle in the 1850s. They create two lines of officers' ranks. There's a line officer rank, and, and then there's an engineering line. And engineering officers, they top out at a certain level. They can't get above a particular level. Whereas the line officers, the ones who fight, that's the way they frame it. They're the ones who can rise all the way up to the highest ranks in the Navy, whereas the engineers are not. And, and so we, we really see, you, what we're seeing is a social cultural battle within the, within the institution itself, mm -hmm. rather than the outside. I think the outside is, is really, uh, Americans are really embracing this. So. Yes? Two things came to mind. Um, from what I read, what made the monitors ocean going, but not really far off the coast, was they put tall funnels on it for ventilation. Yeah. And, and they also rolled the deck a, right. a little bit as well. Yeah, I, I yeah, but. No. No. Yeah. No. And then, <laughs> the, the next uh, question is when, if you know, did they put uh, gears with wheels to elevate and traverse the. 
tenants. Uh, they, they've been using, they've been elevating them. The problem with the monitor, for example, if you notice the, the gun ports and the, the muzzle, right. they're fairly close yeah. in size. Um, and they can only elevate the, the gun four and a half degrees inside the monitor. And there's actually a, there's actually a screw system on the back of Dahlgren's guns. So, so that was early 1850s. Yes. You talked about uh, six miles on range on Dahlgren's gun. No, 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 Dahlgren's gun no. only had a, about a mile, sorry, a two-mile range. It was, it was the um, uh, Ericsson gun. Erickson, uh, sorry, yeah. Ericsson's. Yeah. Um, is that still a smooth bore? Still a smooth bore. And your gun layers can get accuracy. He actually invented a a, a new sighting system as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I can't imagine at six miles it was a terribly accurate right. weapon. Um, you know, we're, we're, you know, even those shells I was talking about, this is a fairly primitive world. The way the, way the shells were designed, so you, you, take oh, a, you have a hollowed out ball, you fill right. it with powder, there's a hole drilled into it, and you, you put a fuse, a, a, basically a, a rope impregnated with, with right. powder into it, and you have to calculate the distance <laughs> to your target, and you cut the fuse <laughs> length, right. because what's going to happen is, is when the projectile, when you fire the gun, the powder is going to envelop the projectile, it's going to light the fuse, and you have to figure out how many seconds it's going to take to get to the right. target and explode, and so you have to cut the fuse, so you're having to calculate all that. Hmm. So, so or you get more sophisticated with the fuse, and you have the different settings. Well, well we're a long way off. Okay. Yeah, we're a long way off from yeah. from that at this point. So, so when we're talking about when we're 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 basically talking about flying flying firecracker crackers that we're having to figure out. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And and literally that's what they're doing. They're they're having to cut them. There. You know, there's a five second fuse, a ten second fuse, and you're calculating your distance to your target, etc. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a different world. Yeah. Yeah. It's a different world. Did they really fire on the up roll for maximum distance? Um, they tried to do that, certainly on wooden ships, right? And, and, and actually, in some cases, they actually would fire. If you're fighting a wooden ship, you would actually fire on the down roll. Because what you're trying to do, you're trying to make it so that you can actually get the other vessel below the water line. So, so you had all kinds of things that they're tricks of the trade. The problem is, is you know, if, if you have one of these weapons and you depress your gun too much, it's a it's a smooth bore, so the projectile is actually smaller than the diameter, so your your projectiles will actually roll out of your gun. So, yeah. So, yeah. Were most of those uh, Mississippi River uh, gunboats and assorted things they designed for the Mississippi River were they they basically iron plated over wood? Yeah, they're they're wooden hulled vessels. And, and most of them would be iron plates. Some of them were actually even just iron railroad rails that would have been turned on their backsides and lined up against each other. So, but some of them, Union tended to use iron plate. Confederates, they would have used iron rail because they didn't have the capacity very much. So they would just, they would just uh, pilfer the, the rail lines and they, they would use that. So. Those water wheel ships, they were weaponized? Um, some of them were, but they didn't last, as, as you saw that with the, with the Birkenstock, uh, the, uh, what was it, the Birkenstack? Birkenhead. They, Birkenhead, yeah, they, they had, they had designed it as a, a screw frigate, and they converted it to a troop ship, so, because they recognized that it wasn't useful as a, as a warship. What's the source of the saying, a, a loose cannon? What's a loose cannon? <laughs> a, a loose, so, you're on the gun deck. Right? And obviously when you, for every reaction, there's an opposite reaction. You fire a projectile out, all that force is going out. You're going to have as much energy going back, so the gun's going to recoil. So a gun on a gun deck, if you go inside, uh, like the USS Constitution, go there to the museum, you'll see that there's these large eye hooks built into the sides of the vessel. And there are lines, and that connect to the carriage as well as the weapon itself. And what they're designed to do is, is when the ship recoil, when the gun recoils, they're going to stop the. It's going to roll back. Right. It's only going to go so far because the lines are holding it. Well, eventually those lines are going to break, mm. and when when those lines break, then you have a loose cannon, and suddenly you have a you know a ten thousand pound projectile rolling all over the vessel. 
Uh, so when that happens on a, on a gun deck, you can literally wipe out 40, 50 people. Those weapons generally have anywhere from, depending on the size of the weapon, uh, anywhere from 12 to 18 men operating them. Okay, so there's a huge number of men operating, and they each have very specialized jobs. So the gun deck is incredibly crowded. Now the monitor only has two guns, but uh, you're still talking about 25 or 30 people operating inside of the, just the gun section of, of the turret. So, and like I said, when they hit those rivets, they suddenly started flying all over. Um, the captain of the USS Monitor in the in the um, uh, the fight with the Virginia on the first day, he had been looking out and got the, the through the uh, um, through one of the ports and when a projectile hit and it blinded him temporarily. He was blinded for three or four four weeks after that particular battle. So. When you, say, the when you say the uh, one of the fellows welded the ring around the camera. That would have been Stockton, yeah. Stockton. What, what method of welding did he use? I, I'm not familiar with what, what welding method he used. <clears throat> yeah, sorry. What other Navy yards were there besides the Uh there's, there's Philadelphia, there's Norfolk, there's Boston. There's Ford, Portsmouth, yeah. and uh, New Hampshire. Maine, yeah. 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 What ship is that? Is the Olympia? Uh, that is the USS Connecticut. <clears throat> That's the USS Connecticut. There's a wonderful picture of the. U I actually have a picture of the USS Connecticut on its on its sea trials when it's doing its speed test. And there's this unbelievable bow wave coming up. And the story is, is the guy was in a rowboat to the side taking a picture. And of course, when the Connecticut came, the bow wave upset the vessel, and he held the camera up out of the water and saved the plate. So it's truly an amazing image. So, yeah, truly an amazing image. When the Wampanoag was running at 16 knots and so on, how much coal, I mean, were there many areas that were to refuel? No. Oh. Yeah. So that would have been a Yeah, that, that, that was an issue. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was certainly an issue. Uh, it could carry five days worth of coal. On, on board, that was that's what it was designed to do. So, so you so would need to carry you would every five days you'd need to refuel. Right. Which of course is why in the late 19th century we see the United States suddenly expanding, uh, right, in the Pacific all over the world to, to get to get navy bases. Yeah. So, yes. Manpower with sail ships versus steamships. Um, much there depends on which steamships you're talking about. It because what. The, the sails were one thing that required a lot of manpower, but the ordnance requires a lot of manpower as well. So it's not until you reduce the sails as well as the number of guns that you can reduce the, the number of people on the vessel. Like I said, the, you know, those, those guns were, were using anywhere from 12 to 18 men. And if you had, if you had like the, the, the USS Constitution carried, minimum carried 44 guns. Okay, um, that some of those vessels were carrying, you know, some of the bigger vessels were carrying as many as 700 men on them. So, so. Did they have sleeping quarters for that many? You men? slept on the gun deck. Well, <laughs> you slept in hammocks on the gun deck. Yeah, yeah. Not not good not good life for for for, for everyday sailors. You know, just go into the Olympia, right, and you go into the officers' quarters. I mean, that's that's good living. Right, and, and and go go to the enlisted people's berth. Even even in the late 19th century, you see this incredible difference. Early 20th century, incredible difference between what you know the enlisted men are living versus the officers. Uh, so. uh, no, coal was when you're using steam, you're using coal, and and, and obviously. It's not until you discover oil in 1859. It's going to be a long time before oil is is going to be the the fuel of use. That's a really 20th century. Didn't the English actually strip out a lot of their forests of oak building the ships? Mm -hmm. It had to be a problem, I think. That yeah. They ran out of wood. Yeah. Yeah, they ran out. They liked the United States. Early, you know, that's why they liked the colonies. And we sold them a lot of wood over the years. Didn't we? Yeah. Well, didn't sell it. They didn't just sell took it. it. Yeah. <laughs> well, at some point, yeah. 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 
and uh, spars particularly. Well, and, and, nice, and you need strength. different you need different wood for different parts of the vessel. Uh, people are surprised to see how many different kinds of wood are, are in, in a vessel. So, for example, like the knees, which are, are really the, 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 the real foundation of the vessels, those, those you would have used uh, white oak or, or yeah, um, oak. live oak. Yeah. Live oak was, was, the, was the wood of choice. And because if you've gone to South Carolina, you see those old live oak trees, and they have these unbelievable branches. What you're looking for is you're looking for a branch that actually is curved to this kind of shape because when, the, when, a, when a tree grows in, in a curve, it actually puts more material in that area to strengthen it. And so shipbuilders were using that technology. And so I have some, I, I, I have, um, I've done in my technology class, I do one on shipbuilding and there's incredible shipbuilding uh, manuals where, where they're teaching the shipbuilders, okay, here's how you look at a tree. And, and superimposed on the tree is here's all the different parts of the ship that you would use from this particular tree. So it's not only that you're not only looking for white pine for the mast, you're you're looking for you're looking for live oak for the for the for the knees, you're looking for white oak for the for the for the for the sides, etc. It's it's a whole bunch of, of different woods. You use you use mahogany for decks and, and they just all have different purposes. So you know on a, a, a a navy vessel, you might see ten or twelve different okay. different species of wood built into it. So. There is a myth that I heard in Lancashire, in, in Lancashire, England, that they actually would grow oaks and tie them together so that they grew in a curve. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if, if they were doing something like that for, for yeah. uh, future use. Yeah. In the U.S., there's so much available; they don't have to resort to that. There's just so much available. Like a nice group. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you all very much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. Years, and, uh, and you know, it's, it's really it's interesting because again, 